Hello and welcome to the online lecture for History 327 for the October 18th class. As the title indicated, indicates, it's about decolonization, particularly dealing with France and Great Britain, and we'll continue a bit of this uh, into Friday, October 20th, class 2. And it's finally time for us to turn to decolonization and its impact on European societies and its role, really, in the post-war settlements. We've seen the you know, impact of the creation of welfare states in the West, the Cold War settlement, the American involvement in Europe, not just politically, but also in, in sort of driving a particular kind of consumer culture. And decolonization has to be now finally integrated into that story. And what's ironic is that neither France nor Britain anticipated that decolonization would happen so rapidly and so extensively in the immediate wake of World War II. Both the British and the French seemed bound to hold on to their empires. But the reality is that France and Britain and the lesser colonial powers, who I'll deal with on Friday, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Portugal, Portugal's an exception actually, uh, but certainly Belgium and the Netherlands, all of, the, all of those countries are forced to give up their imperial aspirations by the mid-1960s. And this is actually part of a process of economic modernization and political reorientation that goes along with what we've already been seeing in terms of the creation of, the, of welfare states, democracies, and uh, the rise of consumer culture. As we'll also see going into next week when we discuss Azuz Begag and Shanty Down Kid, decolonization goes hand in hand with a demographic shift that witnesses the uh, arrival of thousands upon thousands of former colonial subjects in France and Great Britain uh, for not not just ex not exclusively because of decolonization but also in processes that are linked to it right that there is a massive demographic shift that's going to transform the face of Europe uh, beginning in the 1950s so that's where we're going over the next week and a half okay when we think about decolonization right it may seem obvious but it's worth stating that the Second World War triggers or creates factors that drive decolonization. On the one hand, as we've seen, at the, at the end of World War II, France and Great Britain are in financially very dire straits, and holding on to empire is expensive. Moreover, the war had given ammunition to a lot of groups to challenge the very basis for empire. What do I mean? Well, first of all, the Japanese success in Southeast Asia against the Europeans, of course, and the Americans too, a little, to a lesser extent, um, but certainly their success against the French and the British and the Dutch really gave, made the whole myth of European superiority, racial superiority, which had been part of colonialism for several decades, uh, if not a century, it made that seem like the lie that it was. In addition, the Japanese occupation of places like Indonesia and Southeast Asia and what is now Vietnam uh, helped fuel the rise of nationalist groups, uh, sometimes with communist overtones. Sometimes these groups resisted the Japanese, sometimes these groups worked hand in hand with the Japanese, but it bolstered the sort of fey fortunes of nationalist organizations in the places that the Japanese occupied. And finally, the dominant powers of the Cold War era were the United States and the Soviet Union, both of whom, at least on paper, were opposed to empire, were anti-colonial, for different reasons. The United States claimed that it was exporting democracy and it supported it around the world, even though, of course, it, um, as we know, the, that democracy kind of came with some strings attached, and you could argue that you know, American influence around the world, and particularly in South America, was a form of uh, extending its own empire. Uh, likewise, the Soviets made all sorts of noise about resisting colonialism, but of course the Soviet Union itself was kind of an empire uh, in the way that it had been created. And the Soviets were certainly busy spreading their influence around the world uh, after the war too. So their anti-colonialism was, was a useful rhetorical de a device that may not have actually been true in reality. But nonetheless, the, they were vocally hostile to the idea of empire, which you might think was a real impetus for decolonization. And yet, despite these factors, decolonization doesn't happen automatically because why? Well, on the one hand, uh, France and Great Britain 
at least some people in those places, are attached to the idea of empire. This is true for the Netherlands and Belgium, too. Um, there are also, in certain, certain colonial places, white settlers who very much do not want to uh, lose their privileges and their, their privileged status, which they think would happen with decolonization. And colonies, too, despite their heavy economic cost, are often, in the immediate years after 1945, seen in really fantasies by various people as uh, a source of economic recovery. Like the resources of India will help the British recover. The resources of sub-Saharan Africa will help the French recover. Now, these are, these are fantasies, but these are all, these, these justifications go along with the other kinds of uh, forces that may make the French and the British more reluctant to decolonize. And so we'll see how that plays out. What I want to do here, then, is, is trace, in the interest of time, I want to focus on the process of decolonization for French and British colonies. And then on Friday, uh, I'll talk about the Bel Belgian Congo, I'll talk about Indonesia, and I'll talk briefly about Portugal. Not really. Uh, what it, also this will allow me to do is show a great film clip dealing with the Belgian Congo. Okay. In the French case... The process of decolonization was marked by two protracted wars, one in Indochina and one in Algeria, and a smoother process in sub-Saharan Africa that was characterized by the French sticking around, really, even though they formally were no longer in control. What can we say about Indochina, which is the territory, the, the part of the world that is now comprised of Vietnam, uh, Laos, and Cambodia? Well, the French, after World War II, come back into Indochina, which had been their colony beforehand, um, despite the fact that they'd been kicked out by the Japanese during the war. The French return to the dismay of a lot of many people, uh, but war does break out fairly quickly between the French and the followers uh, and the Viet Minh, the group led by Ho Chi Minh, who was a uh, communist, also a Vietnamese nationalist, who had kind of come through the ranks of the French Communist Party. In, he'd studied for a time in Paris, uh, but now by this point he was back in, in, in Vietnam. So war breaks out in June 1946. The French strategy is to, well, to try to win the war militarily by controlling urban enclaves like Hanoi and Saigon, trying to build up local support for the former emperor of Annam, who was a man named Bao Dai, as part of a Vietnamese nationalist coalition, right? So trying to prop up local elites who were loyal to France, and uh, a lot of begging the United States for financial aid. Overall, the French economy could not have sustained the war in Indochina without significant American help, which really ramps up after 1950. And you would think, why after 1950? Well, the Korean War breaks out in 1950, and the Korean War changes the thinking of American military planners, because it makes it seem like there is some sort of global con communist conspiracy, or, well, strategy, rather, in Asia. And so, from the American point of view, it becomes much more important to support the French in their fight against the Viet Minh. And the Americans also put pressure on the French to try to win the war militarily. Uh, that leads to disastrous results, really. The, um, the French military attempts to, quote, win the war militarily uh, up in the northwest portion of Vietnam, in a place called Dien Bien Phu. It's a very steep valley. Uh, the French paratroop in, and the idea here is that they're trying to lure the Viet Minh out into open battle uh, because they think that they will be able to crush them that way. Uh, the Viet Minh surreptitiously bring in all sorts of heavy artillery over through the mountains, through the, for through the, through the forest, and then very quickly uh, wipe out the French garrison at Dien Bien Phu. It's a, it's a siege that lasts about two months. In the end, 3,000 uh, French troops, French, and I, as I'll point out later, uh, most of these people are not actually French. Most of them are actually African soldiers or Vietnamese auxiliaries. Um, 3,000 of them are killed. The Viet Minh lose maybe 10,000. Uh, but this is certainly a huge defeat. France is forced to, to surrender here. And it triggers a round of negotiations that lead to the so-called Geneva Agreements in 1954, with which partition Vietnam into a communist north and a nationalist south uh, at the 17th parallel. So the war in Indochina, which lasts, well, at least the, this portion of the war in Indochina, because of, as we know, it's going to continue, 
um, lasts about eight years. And it is certainly a catastrophe that confirms France's global demotion as a great power, if you will. Uh, but here's the thing, the cost of the war in Indochina for the French are pretty remote. About 20,000 French soldiers die, 50,000 more French colonial soldiers who are fighting for the French die, mostly Africans, um, and they killed 200,000 Vietnamese during this portion of the war. So on the one hand, the, the costs from the, sort of for the white French back home are kind of limited, and the fact of the matter is that Indochina is not a colony where there are lots of white settlers, and so this sort of the impact of Indochina is pretty muted. You know, there are not very many people in France who are super upset about this. Uh, the main group that is upset, of course, is the French military, and the French military's failure into China is going to directly influence what happens more or less right th immediately thereafter in Algeria. And Algeria, of course, is a different kettle of fish or plate of um, spicy merguez sausages or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, Algeria is, a, is, first of all, it's much closer to France. It's 400, it's just straight south across the Mediterranean of Marseille. It had been a French colony since 1830, and even more importantly, it had been a settler colony. Uh, for the, it was really the only French colony where there was a substantial European presence, about a million by 1945. Um, now, these white settlers were all considered French citizens, although many of them were originally Spaniards or Italians or Greeks or Maltese who had come in the 19th century, uh, lured by the promise of land that had been expropriated from the Arabs and Berbers. Algeria was treated as an administrative extension of France. It was illegally you know, one of the parts of France, three départements, as they would say. Um, and European settlers in France, and Europeans in Algeria, had full civil rights, you know, voted in elections, sent delegates to parliament, etc. Uh, as you can probably imagine, the Arab and Berber residents of Algeria were not full citizens at all. In fact, very few of them had any kind of uh, citizenship status. And if they did it, it was because they had uh, gone through French schools and in, in many cases had renounced Islam. Um, after 1945, there are certainly hopes in Algeria among the Arab and Berber populations that uh, there will be some sort of move towards granting Algerians, well, of Arab and Berber Algerians, improved legal standing, but fairly shortly it becomes obvious that the white settlers are not interested in any kind of power sharing arrangement. And so the growing sentiment amongst native Algerians is that uh, collaboration, that trying to work within the system, you know, is just not going to work. And in fact, what it gives rise to is a much more aggressively nationalist organization, the Front de Libération Nationale, the FLN, which basically, you know, led by Algerian Arab nationalists, uh, that opens a guerrilla warfare, guerrilla war against France starting in late 1954, uh, trying to attack French civilian targets, among other things, trying to radicalize public opinion and trying to really galvanize a French response um, to, to ramp up the war. And one example of this is in 1955, the FLN attacks the uh, mining settlement of Philippeville, uh, in which 71 Europeans are killed. The French military kills 12,000 12, Arabs uh, in response. Yay! I mean, not yay. So it's colonial violence in, in full here. Perhaps the even more dramatic, most dramatic example of this it's not what the slide says here, but is uh, the, the the wave of bombing attacks that happened in late September 1956. The FLN sets off a series of bombs in uh, sort of public locations in Algiers, the Air France counter, a popular a popular bar, that actually only kill three people, but are hugely provocative. And this is, by the way, this the main thrust of the movie, the Battle of Algiers, if you've happened to have seen that. And now, Paris, the government back home in, in, in Paris, is forced, is in sort of a tight squat. It's between the demands of the insurgents, the FLN, who want some sort of Al Algerian independence, and the white settlers who don't want any concessions at all. Uh, the strategy that evolves in the short term of the French military is to try to defeat the FLN by force, 
French military strategy is basically to try to crush the rebellion and then force the settlers to make some concessions. So the, the war escalates. The French send in paratroopers. Um, the military resorts to torture to try to figure out you know, who's, who's running the show among the FLN. And you know, for a short while, the French military basically drives the violence out of the major cities. Uh, and the FLN is forced to take refuge in the countryside. But this really provokes crisis back home in France. A lot of people are very upset that the military is resorting to torture. Uh, what this, you know, and wonder what this means for the French Republican, uh, small r, Republican values and, and democracy. Meanwhile, of course, the settlers in Algeria are, and their sort of representatives are, you know, vocally arguing that there should never be compromise with the, with the Algerians. And for reasons that are a little complicated and hard to explain in like 10 seconds, um, there, there's sort of a real threat that a faction of the army that is sort of loyal to the Algerian settlers might actually stage a coup, and uh, there's a brief invasion of Corsica by, by some soldiers, actually. And what this triggers is a crisis back in Paris. Charles de Gaulle, who we'll talk in more detail about on Friday, who's been really in political exile since 1946, is seen as sort of maybe sort of the only figure in France with enough, not enough authority to get the settlers, well, basically to, to win the war and maybe talk some sense into the settlers. And basically he's seen as he's the figure who's acceptable to the settlers because he's seen by them as someone who, who they think will defend French Algeria. So de Gaulle is, is invited back to, to, to sort of create a coalition on in the, right at the beginning of June 1958. And he immediately flies to Algiers on June 4th, where he addresses you know, a mass crowd, mostly of white settlers, and he says, among other things, Algerien, Algerien, Algerians of both genders, Je vous ai compris. I have understood you. But quite tellingly, he does not actually spell out what he has understood, and so he leaves the white settlers in Algeria thinking that he is on their side. He also gives some hope, I think, to the other groups in Algeria that he might um, you know, be somewhat of an honest broker. More than anything else, even though Charles de Gaulle is sort of an old imperialist at heart, he is also very pragmatic. He doesn't like disorder. He sees the white settlers in Algeria as causing enormous problems for France. And he also recognizes that the whole concept of a white settler Algeria is becoming increasingly anachronistic by the late 1950s. And so he begins to open negotiations with the FLN over the question of independence. Now, he's going to face a lot of resistance from the army, and there are going to be uh, sort of some strikes and uh, attempts to well, mobilize the army to take over uh, against him, organized by Alge factions in Algeria. Uh, so but de Gaulle is going to face several moments where it seems like the army might rebel against him. Both times he kind of wins the day. And the long and short of it is that the talks with the FLN lead to a referendum in January 1961 about whether Algeria should become independent. 75% of the people back in mainland France say yes. And so, and this is despite the fact that, you know, at this, po at this point in going forward, uh, a right-wing terrorist group in France, called, in Algeria rather, called the Organisation de, de, de l'Armée Secrète, the Organization of the Secret Army, is doing things like blowing up bridges, trying to assassinate officials, uh, trying to assassinate de Gaulle, as a matter of fact, uh, basically trying to stoke terror in the Algerian population. In July 1962, the formal independence of Algeria is pronounced at the Evian Accords. Yes, that's the water bottle. That's the bottled water city. And de Gaulle announces the independence of Algeria. Uh, what happens then, as this picture to the right indicates, is that you have a huge exodus of about a million white settlers from Algeria called Pied Noir, Black Feet. It's a derogatory term, actually, uh, for these folks because they theoretically have their feet stuck in the black soil of Algeria. So they flee back to France and settle in mostly in the south. They are accompanied by tens of thousands of Arki, H-A-R-K-I-S. The Arki are Arabs and Berbers, uh, Algerians, who have served in the French forces and who are forced to flee because they fear reprisals in the newly independent Algeria. Many of them will spend uh, up to a decade in refugee camps in France. They are not welcomed with open arms, for sure. 
So here then, the process of decolonization in Algeria is a protracted war. It's another eight-year war, basically. Um, here, however, there's the immediate tangible impact of a huge population flow back to France. Ironically, as we'll talk about on Friday, the process of de Gaulle coming back to power, which comes in the middle of the Algerian crisis, actually is going to sort of help the French state function more effectively. It'll lead to some constitutional changes that make France, uh, make the government a little bit less uh, prone to being paralyzed by political rivalries, makes the French government a little bit more like the U.S. is in terms of having a strong president. So the ironic after effect here of, of decolonization is that the French state is actually strengthened in the process. The final point about at least the French experience, at least for our purposes here, is that in contrast to the two wars, the war in Indochina and the war in Algeria, uh, in the early 1960s, the French quietly sort of devolved power in their sub-Saharan colonies, so places like Ivory Coast and Senegal. Um, power is devolved into the hands of reliably loyal Africans, but very Francophone, very French-oriented Africans. In other words, a lot of uh, elites, African elites who had gone to school in France, who had kind of some of the few who had gone through the colonial schooling system and who certainly saw themselves in some ways as almost more French than African, uh, also was part of this process. French companies retained an enormous influence in, in sub-Saharan Africa, companies like Total, the, the, the petrochemical giant. So two different kinds of decolonization, in part the experience in sub-Saharan Africa is made easier because there aren't white settlers to you know, demand that the French stay. And again, the contrast I would say between into China and Algeria is that into China, yes, the French military is fighting a war against what it perceives to be communist insurrection. It's trying to hold on to a colony that people back in the French don't necessarily care a whole lot about. Whereas Algeria is a much more visceral experience. It's much closer. Uh, the, the process of decolonization is more traumatic. And I should also point out too that uh, it's a, there's essentially a it's not only a draft, but uh, a lot of French young men have to go fight in Algeria during the period between 1954 and 62. Um, so it's a little bit like Vietnam for Americans in the sense that it's experienced by a large section of the population, um, and so it's much more traumatic at the national level than the process in Vietnam. Okay. Let's turn to the process of decolonization in, in for the British, at least, which is marked by fewer, well, there isn't the same sort of wide-scale war or sort of wars of decolonization as there are in the French examples, although there's certainly plenty of violence. In the case of India, here decolonization is driven by financial difficulties. As we've all seen, the, the labor government after 1945 is desperate to try to implement its domestic program and empire is a big problem. Um, so sort of somewhat unwillingly, labor is forced to accelerate the process of decolonizing uh, in India and also in Palestine, which I'll mention again in a second. And in part, it's a little easier to go through this process in India because there are fully formed institutions and political parties here, uh, Indian elite, in, you know, South Asian elites, who have been clamoring for independence for quite some time. And so uh, the British realize that Basically, they're better off decolonizing at this point and turning power over to these folks. Um, however, of course, the situation in India is complicated by the rivalry between the two main factions, between the Congress Party, which is mainly Hindu, um, led by Jawaharlal Nehru and Mohandas Gandhi, and the Muslim League, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Jinnah argued that uh, Britain needed to allow India's Muslims their own state, which, of course, is going to become Pakistan. With mounting violence between... Most, mostly religious violence between Hindus and Muslims, the British speed up the process of what's called of well transferring power to the local to the native elites, um, but it also in, in also a process of partitioning the former British Raj into India and then a West and East Pakistan. East Pakistan is going to become Bangladesh after a, a little war in the 1970s. The process of partition. August 15th, 1947, triggers immediate huge population flows. About 9 million Muslims from other parts of India flow into West and East Pakistan, and Hindus go the other way from what is now West and East Pakistan into India proper. 
And hundreds of thousands, if not up to a million uh, people die in this process. So, uh, anyone who tells you that the process of decolonization in, in British colonies is somehow less vital than the French is sort of t distorting the evidence in a way because, yes, the, the British don't fight a sort of full-fledged war here as the French do in Indochina or in Algeria, uh, but there's a lot of violence and death as part of the process. Uh, the French do actually fight an outright, or no, sorry, the British do actually fight an outright war in Malaya, which is now Malaysia, uh, because here there's, like in Vietnam, there is a communist insurrection. And this insurrection lasts until about 1954, uh, and the British sort of successfully win out here because they have local partners, particularly the Chinese, Malay Chinese, who av avidly support them. Uh, and the communists in the, the in the Malayan communists don't have the same kind of popular support that the Viet Minh have in Vietnam. So the British are actually kind of able to stave off decolonization here and, and sort of use force to have it done on their terms. And the Middle East is harder. And so here I'm jumping around a little bit chronologically, but I hope this makes sense. Uh, as we've already seen, the British are forced to withdraw from Palestine in 1947-48, basically handing it over to the United Nations. This is a humiliation for British Britain, but it's relatively bloodless. Most of the violence, again, happens after the British leave. Huh, a familiar story. The situation in Egypt is more humiliating for the British, and the French also get sucked into this too. Now, Egypt had not been a conventional colony, for reasons I don't need to get into here. Um, the important point is that the British had occupied the zone... The, the Suez Canal. Essentially, the British British had controlled the Suez Canal after 1952 directly. However, the advent of Gamal Abdel Nasser as leader of Egypt after 1954, he's an Egyptian nationalist, um, he is seen increasingly as, by the French, by the Americans, by the British as a threat because he uh, they perceive him to either be pro-Soviet or sympathetic to the FLN in Algeria. In July 1956, July 26, 1956, Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal, takes it over, and so the British are sort of aced out here. And what happens instead is that the British and the French hatch a plan, along with the Israelis, to take back the canal zone. Uh, the plan is that the Israelis will attack and take it over. The French and the British will say, no, no, Israel, you need to withdraw, but then they'll occupy it and, and uh, take over the canal zone. And the hope is that this would undermine Nasser and cause him to I don't know, be deposed in Egypt. The British assumed that the Americans were going to think this is a fantastic idea. So on October 29th, the Israeli forces uh, cross into the Sinai Peninsula. By November 5th, there are French and British troops on the ground in the, canal, uh, in the Sinai Peninsula and around the canal. Then everything falls apart because President Eisenhower in the United States, uh, having just been re-elected, uh, is furious at the British and threatens to basically stop propping up the British currency, the pound. Two days later, the French and British are forced to kind of halt hostilities. A United Nations force is sent there, and eventually the French and the British are forced to withdraw, and the British have a huge currency crisis. The canal reopens in April 1957, and it's still in Egyptian hands. So this whole incident uh, is a humiliating moment for the French and the British really proves, once again, that by now they really cannot throw their weight around in the world the way that they used to, particularly if the Americans don't go along with it. And in fact, what really what the Suez Crisis does, for the British even more so than the French, is it forces a reevaluation of foreign policy. On the one hand, it accelerates the process of decolonization in Sub-Saharan Africa. Here we have a snappy image of Kwame Nkrumah, who's the first uh, leader of what's called at the time Gold Coast, it's now Ghana, which is really, it's the first British sub-Saharan colony to become independent after, well, it's, it becomes so in 1957. Uh, between 1960 and 1964, 17 more British colonies become independent in, in, in Africa. And overall, this process is relatively peaceful. The British here are more or less abandoning their colonial aspirations. However, there are some problems where there are white settlers. Kenya, where there's an extensive uh, white settler presence, South Africa, which already was more or less de facto independent anyway, and Rhodesia, which was not. Um, in the case of Kenya, there is a 
there was a bloody campaign against the so-called Mau Mau rebels, where the British set up special internment camps, uh, more or less uh, detention camps that are quite violent and brutal. Um, the British sort of wait out the rebellion, at least sort of crush it militarily. And then the white settlers are... Most of them leave, actually, but uh, or, go to, or go to Rhodesia or other places where they, they still have the upper hand. South Africa becomes fully independent as a state in 1961, where the law of the land is apartheid, the policy that legally excluded black Africans from any kind of meaningful participation in political life. Uh, Rhodesia is slightly different, too. Rhodesia, where you have, again, a, which is just north of South Africa, where you, uh, which is now uh, Zimbabwe, where you had a small white settler presence and a large African population. Uh, but the white settlers here do not want independence because they don't, they fear that it will turn into, um, you know, that their influence, that white minority rule will be overthrown. And so Rhodesia unilaterally declares independence, what's called UDI, under Prime Minister Ian Smith on, in, 1965, and then there will be a 14-year, uh, basically, guerrilla war, uh, the white settlers against uh, the ZAN, ZANU, uh, against the the African uh, African insurgents, uh, one of them being Robert, Robert Mugabe, who, of course, has been the effective dictator of Zimbabwe ever since independence in 1979, 80. Okay, so these are the white settler colonies are the exceptions, but again, the, the basic point here is that British policy after the Suez Crisis is to kind of turn away from empire and turn towards the United States. The British politicians conclude really their best hope for influence in the in the world going forward is a, in close tandem with the United States, being the United States sort of special partner. So both. France and Britain face substantial challenges of decolonization and both navigate them, you know, with varying degrees of quote-unquote success. In the French case, there are two protracted wars, one which nearly causes the French state to collapse, that's the Algerian one. Uh, ironically, it actually strengthens France going forward. Um, and again, in the French case, Sub-Saharan Africa kind of quietly decolonizes in ways that still benefit the French. In the British case, there are fewer outright wars, although there's certainly quite a lot of violence in Malaya and in the settler colonies, and then there's the whole crisis in the Suez. Overall, for the British, it really confirmed their orientation towards Washington and not Europe. And in both cases, decolonization frees up resources for economic modernization and growth, and it is paralleled by huge population flows back to the mainland. Not simply white settlers going back to, to France, say, in the case of Algeria, but even before decolonization happens, uh, lots of flows of uh, single men to go work in France uh, from the former colonies. This is also true of South Asians going back to Britain, uh, Trinidadians, uh, other folks from the Caribbean going to Britain. So decolonization is happening, and there's also a parallel flow of labor from the former colonial periphery back to the what's called the metropole to, to France and Britain. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. We'll pick up with some of the other ones, some of the other cases of decolonization on Friday, uh, and I'll also uh, think in a little more detail about the impact of Charles de Gaulle. Uh, but I do want you to uh, answer one question for me. Please send me an email that in a sentence or two explains why the process of decolonization in Algeria was so violent. Uh, that way I know that you've been following along here. Uh, so not a huge graded assign not a graded assignment at all, but just a little indicator that you were uh, you were on board with this whole adventure. All right, thanks for listening, and I will see you on Friday.